Well, in the 1950s, television was in its infancy. As network stations sought to fill their airwaves, local affiliates began their experimentation. The end result was an exciting mixture of news, entertainment, and much more. One of the first big successes was Steve's show, hosted by a 20-something former disc jockey named Steve Stevens. His popular teen dance show predated the long-running American bandstand, and it set the tone for what TV could become. Joining me now is the legendary Steve Stevens, the golden-throated TV and radio personality who was a, a pioneer in early television in Arkansas. He's been in radio and television for nearly six decades. He was the primary interview in our recent Talk Business quarterly feature report on the golden age of television in Arkansas. Steve, welcome to the program. Oh, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, I, I've, I've you know, heard about you since I was a little boy, and I've wanted to be, be, be on any kind of show with you. <laughs> You're funny. No, truly it is. Uh, I've complimented you before on what all you've done in the business world, your publications and so forth, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy that you've done so well. Writer Susie Parker actually wrote the story, our cover story, on the golden age of television. Her lead in the story reads... It was the era of three martini lunches, except on Friday when four was the rule. <laughs> Does that sum up the times? No, you know what? <laughs> uh, I know Dale Nicholson says that. Uh, the salespeople did that. And, uh, but I was on the air, and I always had to make sure that I could speak you know, somewhat <laughs> coherently. So I never did, uh, I never did have a, any kind of drink during the day. But the sales personnel for all the TV stations were notorious for having long martini lunches. Well, tell me how you got your start in television. You, you were on KTHV in the 1950s. You were not only started the popular Steve's show, dance uh, show, which we'll talk about, but you were a weatherman in, uh, in the evenings. Uh, but how did you get your first big break? Well, you know, when I was in the Marine Corps, uh, fellows would say to me, were you ever in radio? And I said, no. Well, you have a radio sounding voice. And I just brushed it off. And, and uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I went back to Newport, Arkansas, my home, and was going to go in business with my dad in the furniture business, but it was uh, just not my thing. And there was a small radio station, 1,000 watt station there. And so I went out and asked the uh, manager, could I uh, audition? He said, you can. And then he said, well, you've got v good voice quality, but your southern accent's just awful. So you, know, you may want to work on that. So I did, and I said, could I hang around? And at that time in radio, uh, most radio announcers were drifters. They either drank too much, cashed bad checks or what have you, and moved on because their inventory was their voice, and they could always get another job. So this happened in the instance some guy didn't show up, and so I, long story short, I got his job at that station. Then, Sonny Burgess and the Pacers, who are still mm -hmm. on the scene, Sonny and I graduated together from high school in Newport. He got a baseball scholarship, I got a musical scholarship to Washita. I went into broadcasting, of course, he's, he's still rocking, <laughs> as the saying goes. Uh, Sonny uh, was coming to Little Rock to appear on some sort of television show uh, with his band, and at that time they had bought an old uh, Cadillac hearse was their touring van, and they said, you want to go with us? And I said, sure. So we came from, uh, we drove from uh, Newport to Little Rock. That, well, that time was about a two and a half, three hour drive. Between Newport and Little Rock, they stopped about six times for refreshments, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so by the time they got to Little Rock, they were ready to rock and roll, and I was wandering around the TV studios, and there was a door that said program manager, and it was open, and I walked in, and in my infinite uh, suaveness, I said, you guys don't need an announcer, do you? <laughs> and so Jack Bomar, who turned out to be a great mentor in my life, um, he says, as a matter of fact, you know, we do. We had to fire a guy for being drunk all the time. And I said, well, I don't drink all the time. <laughs> and so we hit it off, and he said, well, uh, won't you send me a tape? Went back to Newport. I didn't. I forgot about it. And so I'll be darned if he didn't call me. And, you know, you look back over your life, and you think, you know, key people made key decisions that influenced my life, and he was one who did that. He said, why don't you come on back down and, and uh, take an audition? I said, okay. So I came back to Little Rock, and they said, you see out there in the studio, there's a mock set of a kitchen. Go out there and sell everything in that kitchen. Well, what they didn't know was that every summer, I'd work in my dad's furniture and appliance store, and I was familiar with the workings of, uh, of selling appliances. So I walked out and I said, take a look at this oven. Big place, you know, for the for turkey. The controls are out of the reach of the children. I just went on and on and they marveled at it. <laughs> and so then they, uh, they said, well, you know, pretend uh, you're, give, give us your take on your radio disc jockey show. I said, well, I was a rhyming DJ, 
they said, well, give us that. And I said, okay, uh, uh, this is your DJ spinning away their special day songs that pass the test. Here's proof. A cat that doesn't goof, EP from Memphis, Tennessee, the cat with all the action and that look of satisfaction, Elvis Presley. They said, hey, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, I got the job at a very, very pitiful salary. <laughs> but it was a question of, did I want to be on TV or not? And, and management always had the advantage over on-the-air people because... You know, we knew that if we uh, gave management an ultimatum, there were 10 guys standing in the way yeah. that would do it for free. So uh, that was the start of it. And then one day, uh, this Jack said, uh, uh, we're thinking about starting a dance party. I said, what is that? He said, well, you spin records and kids dance. I said, I can do that. So that's how it started. That's how Steve's show that's started. That's how it started. Mm -hmm. But we overproduced. Uh, as most people do, most uh, things that are new, you, you overdo it. We put out, we went to all the high schools in Little Rock and said, uh, the, you're, we're going to have a dance party, the, the boys will wear coats and ties, the girls will dress this way, that way. Well, the first show I had, nobody showed up. It was, it was just really more than embarrassing. <laughs> and so what did you do I, to fill the time? Well, very good question. That's why you're the interviewer and <laughs> I'm the guest. Um, a good question because I said, oh my God, there's nobody here. And they said, live, you're on, here's Steve's show. And I said, you know, uh, uh, many of you, uh, for te uh, television is new, why don't you let me show you around the studio and show you how it works. So I interviewed the cameraman. <laughs> we went inside the, all of the equipment and all that sort of thing. And kids had been watching and some of them came down and were looking in. There was a, a window on the door to the studio and were looking in like that. And I, when, when I spun a record and I was walking around, they had a camera on, on me, I walked over and said, let them in. And so that's how it started, with no coats, no ties. Kids came directly from school to Steve's show. There was no blueprint for what you guys were doing back in that day, yeah. or was there? You were just, was, it, was there any discipline to it at all? Was there anything that was a pattern? As long as we didn't do anything illegal or, 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 or you know, bad, uh, that was the good thing about it. Uh, that uh, there was no precedent. See, when I went into television, that t Channel 11 had only been on the air two years. And so whatever we did was okay because nobody had established any precedent before us. And if it, if it worked, we did it again. If it didn't work, we didn't do it again. It was that simple. And every time I went out to do Steve's show, I never had a script. We just, they said, all right, Steve, stand by. We're getting ready to go on the air. So uh, then I'd go out and they'd play the music, Hi-Ho Steve-O, and then I'd come over with, well, welcome, we've got a lot of kids here from various parts of Arkansas, and we'll be interviewing them and play some records, and you're going to have a great time, and here we go, and that was it. Our guest has been the legendary Steve Stevens, an early pioneer in Arkansas's golden age of television. Uh, the story about the early years of Arkansas television can be found in our latest edition of Talk Business Quarterly, which is on stands. And also you can find it online at talkbusiness.net. Steve, thank you so much for your time and, and for your friendship. And thank you for both also. Thank you.